Thank you very much for uh, the invitation and the opportunity to present today. I also would like to start by apologizing for not being able to be with you in person to, due to unexpected personal circumstances, but I'm looking forward to the, our discussions today. So as a disclaimer, this is just to say that uh, my lab has a number of uh, collaboration with industry and currently we have ongoing collaboration with Abby and Idorsia. I am also a founder and CSO of a new biotech company called Indie Biosciences, also focusing on developing novel therapies and diagnostics for neurodegenerative diseases. I'd like to start by giving credit where credit is due and, uh, and acknowledge the people who deserve all the credit that I will uh, present today. I will highlight the names and pictures of the people who are involved in each project, but without their dedication and effort, none of this would have been possible. So over the past 20 years, uh, my lab has been interested in uh, investigating protein misfolding in neurodegenerative diseases. And by protein misfolding, I mean basically the failure of protein to fold and adopt their native states or remain folded. Under those conditions, usually protein, when they fail to misfold, they accumulate a misfolded intermediate that then go on either to form disordered aggregates or self-assemble into more ordered oligomeric species that eventually go on to form what we know as amyloid fibrils. Amyloid fibrils are highly ordered, stable beta sheet rich structure that are usually characterized by a specific cross beta sheet conformation that you see here, where you have a stacking of beta sheet along the axis of the fibrils and a stacking of multiple sheets to give this cross beta sheet structure. This cross beta sheet structure is unique to amyloid fibrils and thus it's possible to develop molecules that are specific for these amyloid fibrils and can distinguish this beta sheet conformation from other native beta sheet conformations. These fibrils are usually found as the primary constituents of protein, misfolded protein aggregates that accumulate in neurodegenerative diseases. And they usually, depending on the type of the disease, they accumulate in different regions in the brain, usually in the region that is affected in the disease, despite the fact that these proteins are highly expressed throughout the brain, suggesting that there is selective neuronal vulnerability for each of these proteins. They usually start and form in one specific part of the brain, and then over time as the disease progress, they spread into different regions of the brain, and hence, and, and, and it's thought that this is uh, responsible for the spread, the, the progression of the disease and the symptoms that uh, increasing number of symptoms that appear as the disease progress. Of course, all of this leads to massive neuronal loss and atrophy in the affected uh, brain regions. One thing that these, all of these diseases have in common today is the fact that in, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and and ALS, for example, is the fact that we don't have diagnostic tests for early diagnosis. We don't have treatment that prevent or modify the course of the disease. And for most of these diseases, the underlying mechanisms remain unknown, mostly because the disease are, as we increasingly knowing now that the diseases are complex and most uh, multifactorial. Another common feature is the continued clinical trial failures in uh, neurodegenerative disease. So far, all clinical trials aimed at attacking this aggregation process in Alzheimer's disease have failed. And similar, we're now getting similar failures in, in areas such as uh, Parkinson's disease as well. And I don't see any more compelling evidence for us to pause and rethink how we are approaching these diseases than uh, the lack of treatment and continued failure of clinical trials. So what I would like to do today is, is sort of make the case of why do we need to rethink how we study and target protein aggregation in neurodegenerative diseases. I'd like to make the case for embracing complexity as necessary for tackling these diseases. I will also highlight the growing gap between how we, how, you know, the process of protein aggregation and pathology formation in the brain, 
And the reductionist approaches that we use today in, to study these uh, diseases in cell-free systems and preclinical models. <clears throat> I will then highlight two examples from our lab that illustrate you know, the, how we are now trying to deconstruct, reconstruct this complexity uh, to show that it's actually poss possible. And if the time allows, I will show them how you know, deconstructing this complexity is allowing us to look at disease mechanism and processes, but also therapies in a new and a different way than before. And I hope, uh, look forward to an interactive discussion. Let me start by sort of asking, you know, sort of highlighting why do most clinical trials fail today? And perhaps the most important, I will try to address this in the context of Parkinson's disease, which will be the topic that I will cover for most of my talk. So for those of you who are not familiar, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder that is characterized by a combination of motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. David Smith, I'm undergoing an evaluation. The non-motor symptoms is usually involved with tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, difficulty in initiating movement. And it's thought to be mainly due to the loss of do dopamine producing neurons in the substantia 9. Other non-motor symptoms include constipation, uh, olfactory dysfunction, sleep disruption, depression, anxiety, and then those are thought to involve the limbic system and the cerebral cortex. At the pathological level, the disease is characterized by the loss of dopamine neuron in the substantia 9, first at least in the early stages. And then the presence of these cytoplasmic inclusions in surviving dopaminergic neuron that we know now are composed of fibrillar aggregates of the presynaptic protein alpha synuclein. And alpha synuclein has been linked to Parkinson's disease by both neuropathological and genetic evidence. So several genetic mutations in the gene that code for the protein alpha synuclein have been linked to early onset form of Parkinson's disease. And we thought early on that if these mutations cause early onset and aggregation is a dominant pathogenic process in these disease, then we would expect that many of these mutations would accelerate the aggregation process. And indeed, this is what we see. The mutations segregate into different classes, ones that accelerate the early oligomerization event and others that accelerate both oligomerization and fibrillization of the protein. Moreover, you don't need a mutation in synuclein to get Parkinson's, simply doubling the concentration of the protein due to gene duplication or triplication is sufficient to cause early onset form of the disease. Again, all of these evidence pointing to this protein as a central player in the disease. Usually aggregation starts in, 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 in a neuron where the protein starts to oligomerize. It forms small fibrils that can grow on by monomer addition, some, at some point, these fibrils transition to these deposits, which we will talk about today. The mechanism is still unclear. However, these aggregates, it turns out, are, you know, get secreted by neurons and taken by neighboring cells, neurons, astrocytes, and other cell types. And once they're there, they basically corrupt the endogenous protein, act as a seed, induce more aggregation, and the process can go on and on via different mechanisms, including endocytosis, synaptic, or membrane receptors. And it's thought that this is the basic cell-to-cell -cell propagation process that's responsible for the propagation of aggregates in the brain of Parkinson's disease. So if you're a Parkinson disease patient today, then you're probably still taking the same therapy that your grandparents or your parents was taking in 1965. In fact, there are no therapies to treat Parkinson today. Most of what you see here are therapeutic approaches that are aimed at alleviating some of the symptoms of the disease rather than the underlying cause of the disease. There are promising new direction in stem cell transplant, but it's too early. Deep uh, brain stimulation remains the most effective therapy for people who no longer respond to L-DOPA and other therapies. It remains an invasive surgical uh, procedure that is very expensive uh, and it still carries some risks. So why are neurodegenerative diseases difficult to treat? One of the main reasons is the fact that these diseases usually start 15 to 20 years before the symptoms are manifested. 
This is a graph that shows the progression of Parkinson disease symptoms, the pre-motor symptoms and the motor symptoms as a function of time from the point when the disease, when the motor symptoms start to appear. So you can see between 20 years before the disease, the main symptoms are symptoms that some may, one can sort of mistake for other diseases like constipation, depression, excessive daytime sleepness. And then, you know, movement, you know, by the time these, you start to get rigidity and you get this dyskinesia. Basically, by the time you, you notice the main cardinal symptoms of the disease, the patient have lost already 65% of their dopaminergic neurons. And then people can progress into different, uh, you know, a combination A patient may have at one time up to 13 different times of uh, uh, symptoms. This makes early diagnosis of the disease difficult. It also makes intervention and prevention clinical trials very difficult and expensive because they would require extensive time. But perhaps the, one of the, the, the most uh, important reason for, for why it's difficult to treat these diseases is because there is no such a thing as a Parkinson's disease or an Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that these are not a single entity diseases and each disease is a collection of disorders with unique molecular signature and driven by distinct molecular drivers as we'll talk later. What you see here in the right is, is graphs that, that basically plot the clinical score progression of different Parkinson disease patients in this DINOPAC cohort. And what you see is that no two patients are the same. There's huge amount of variability among the individual patients. And you don't actually need to see this data to see it. If you have had the chance to meet with Parkinson disease patients, which we do often in our lab, in fact, we even bring them to teach in our classes. When you sit with them, you will find that, you know, there is no two Parkinson's are the same. The clinical symptoms are very different. The rate of progression and the duration of the disease is different. So these diseases are quite heterogeneous. For many decades, we focused on neurodegenerative diseases as brain diseases, and, and, and we studied pathology mainly on the brain, neglecting the rest of the body. It turns out now that uh, you know, Parkinson's disease uh, it can be classified at least into two types of Parkinson's disease, one that is called brain-first versus gut-first Parkinson's disease. And this is based on a study of a very large cohort suggesting that in some patients, the pathology actually starts in the gut and then moves and spreads to the brain. Whereas in some other types of Parkinson's disease, the pathology starts in the brain and moves to the gut. And there are evidence from epidemiological studies that, for example, people who had bigotomy as a treatment for ulcer long time ago were actually protected from Parkinson's disease. The vagal nerve is usually the highway that connects the brain and the guts. And it's thought that this pathology is transported through this. <clears throat> we now know that the gut microbiome is an important modifier of Parkinson's disease development and progression. And there is actually evidence that Parkinson's disease, the, the microbiome of PD patients is different from normal. And in preclinical model, manipulation of the microbiome or disruption of the vagal nerve connection is sufficient to block the spreading of pathology from the brain to the gut or the gut to the brain. So we have now diseases that are actually of different body origin, but also these diseases can be triggered by different factors. And we know now that bacterial infection and viral infection can actually trigger neurode neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease. So the fact that you have diseases that can start in different organs and can be initiated by different triggers it's, you know, suggests that we're dealing with disease heterogeneity and the multiple disease subtypes, and therefore it's unlikely to have a one-size-fits-all therapy or a monotherapy that can tackle all these different forms of the disease. Today, if we Parkinson's disease and the latest data have been divided into four subtypes, and as you can see in this here, most of this division is basically on luck and clinical symptoms and rate of progression of the disease. We've made a lot of progress in Alzheimer's disease because we have PET tracers, we have peripheral biomarkers, and using imaging data that looks at pathology in the brain, looks at disease duration and other factors, 
it's now, it, you know, their Park Alzheimer's disease has also been classified into at least four subtypes of the disease, and we expect to see more. So there is no such a thing as typical Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. When I started working on this field, we were always, we always learned that each of these pathologies that you see in the brain is associated with one protein. And we always study these diseases in the context of one protein, except for Alzheimer's disease, where we know that it's characterized by the pathology by amyloid plaques and tau. But even there, we typically study this protein individually. It turns out now that the presence of one type of aggregates is actually the exception rather than the norm. And most patent neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases are characterized by the multiple, the presence of multiple pathologies. In fact, 80% of Parkinson's disease patients have at least three different types of pathologies in the brain. And this has a number of implications because we do not have any mo preclinical models that reproduce these co-pathologies. And most therapeutic approaches and clinical trials today are based on targeting one therapy at a time. Another important layer of complexity is that we always think of, the, you know, when we describe these aggregates, we tend to give them one name. But when you look in the brain, you can see that here we're looking at tau, different types of tau aggregates, different types of synuclein and amyloid plaques. In fact, there is at least nine different types of amyloid plaques that have been described. And what you could see, these aggregates exist in very different morphologies and different shapes. And we believe that this reflects significant differences at the level of biochemical and structural properties of the aggregates. And this presents a number of, of, of challenges in terms of you know, using a single PET imaging agent or a single drug to try to capture this diversity. And you can see the same in Parkinson's disease. This is the different types of synuclein Lewy pathologies that can be detected in, in Parkinson's disease brain. What we don't know is whether this is a continuum or these represent distinct types of pathologies. And I'll come back to that later. But what I hope you can see now is we're dealing you know, with things that are characterized by different disease subtypes, uh, complex uh, di you know, pathological diversity in the brain and uh, Another major reason is the lack of preclinical models that uh, sort of reproduce the, the, the disease. So there are today no models of Alzheimer's disease and no models of Parkinson's disease. None of the existing models uh, pre, you know, takes into account the complexity that I just highlighted in terms of pathological diversity, co-pathologies, and, 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 and therefore, it's not surprising that these models are not predictive of success in clinical trials. All models are wrong, but some models are useful in the sense that these models reproduce some specific aspect of the disease, but not the full spectrum of the disease. Then, therefore, you know, we have no reliable and predictive preclinical model uh, for these diseases. Obviously, the solution is to develop better models, to use multiple clinical models. But in my opinion, the first step is to abandon models that do not work. Another important thing is, is most of these neurodegenerative diseases, it's surprising to many, but the fact that the normal function of the proteins is still unknown. Synuclein has been investigated for three decades. A number of functions have been described to synuclein, but the knockout models are okay. And it's not very clear what its normal function. And what this means is that for many years, their focus has been dominated by looking at aggregation and gain of toxic functions rather than exploring also the potential uh, loss of function due to the loss of this protein to aggregation as potential mechanisms. Simply, we don't have the models and there's usually very little assays. And mm -hmm. so what I would like to summarize this is this, that the challenge of the, you know, one of main reasons in my opinion is the reluctance to embrace the complexity of these diseases. We know that they're not one disease. We know that they're not caused by one gene, and most of them have a number of genes that are associated either in a deterministic way or as risk factors. And we know that the proteins are expressed usually exist in a mixture of very different forms, either different isoforms or different modified forms. And there are no multiple mechanisms have been implicated in neurodegeneration linked to these proteins. 
Yet today, we're still targeting these diseases by targeting one protein and one pathology at a time. And we believe that sort of this is one of the reasons of failure. So the idea is that, you know, a, a disease that are characterized by multiple triggers, multiple subtypes, multiple pathologies, multiple mechanisms, and multiple targets cannot be treated with a monotherapy. And the future, in my opinion, is going to be combination and personalized therapies, and that drug development should embrace the use of multiple uh, models. One of the challenges we have today for this is, is the lack of biological and imaging biomarkers. We have made great progress in Alzheimer's disease. We can image amyloid and tau in the brain. But when it comes to Parkinson's disease, we do not have yet any reliable peripheral biomarkers for early diagnosis to monitor disease progression or any imaging biomarkers to image uh, protein aggregates of synuclein in the brain. And therefore, we don't have the tools to stratify the patient or to assess target engagement for many synuclein targeting therapies. So one of the fundamental questions in the field of neurodegeneration and also in Parkinson's disease as well is the fact that we see these aggregates in the brain of patients in most of them. And the question is, are they the cause or the consequence of the disease? This is a question that have been debated for years. And what we know is that the level of low pathology, for example, Lewy body pathology correlates with disease development, cognitive decline, and disease progression, but not in all cases. We also know that you can find these protein aggregates of amyloid Lewy bodies in the brain of healthy individuals who die without any symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And there are forms, genetic forms of Parkinson's disease where there are no synuclein aggregates in the brain. And this has led, this in combination with clinical trial failures has led people to reconsider this protein aggregation hypothesis and whether protein aggregation actually plays a central role in the disease. One possible explanation for the lack of correlation between pathology and disease is the fact that the disease may be caused by a soluble aggregate that actually occurs before, that occurs before these Lewy bodies, they called oligomers, and that's known as the oligomer hypothesis. So today, if the only way to test this hypothesis is really in the clinic, and that is to have drugs that can either prevent protein aggregation, and if they don't prevent the disease, then we can uncouple protein aggregation from the disease, or drugs that can sort of inhibit pathology formation independent of the disease. So as I said, you know, one of the main challenges in the field today is that all the tools we have from imaging agents, from antibodies, from small molecules, allow us only to see the product of this process in the brain. That is, we can see the fibrils, we can see the inclusions, but we cannot see anything in between. Whereas in the test tube, we can monitor the entire process using extensive tools and set of biophysical tools. What this means is that we can't, we don't have the tools or the model systems to understand the role of these early intermediate in the disease. And also, you know, therefore we cannot study the process. What we're correlating is the product to neurodegeneration or disease, but not the process to the disease. And for this one needs to develop models that can capture the entire process but also the diversity of pathology that we see in the brain. So what we know from the clinic is that if we remove aggregate from the brain, it does not help the patient, nor does it slow the progression of the disease. That is, once aggregates are formed, it could be that you know, removing them does not do good, and it could be that the damage is already done. What we, want, what we don't know is whether blocking the process of aggregation completely is sufficient to prevent disease development. And what we need to answer this is to begin to think not in the context of aggregates, but in the context of the process of aggregation. And once we do this, we can explain all of these discrepancies between pathology, and I'll show you how we do this. So if we want to study the whole process, then we need to do, we need to understand what triggers the process, we need to understand what's the mechanism by which we go from a normal protein to this complex pathological structures that you see in the brain. And then we can ask the question, will inhibiting this process prevent or slow the progression of the disease? 
today we do not have a model that allow us to monitor this process. And this is what we set out to, to try to develop. Now, when I started in this field and for the past two decades, our, and our interest in these diseases has been driven by the images that you see here, these fibrils. And the idea that most of these pathologies are composed primarily of these amyloid fibrils that I told you. Uh, studies before show that you can isolate images like these showing the isolation of fibrils from inclusions from Parkinson, dementia with Lewy bodies with multiple system atrophy, led people to focus on studying fibrillization rather than pathology formation because people thought this is the main component of Lewy bodies. And therefore, a lot of the studies we have, at least in terms of biophysical and cell free system studies, have focused on taking recombinant protein and monitoring how they aggregate. And this has helped us understand quite a lot about the mechanism of aggregation, the intermediate that can occur, but we have not been able to go from monomer to the complex Lewy body we see in the brain. Recently with this, you know, with the advances in correlative light electron microscopy, we've come to learn that these Lewy bodies are much more complex than the amyloid fibrils. That amyloid fibrils is only one component they're actually not made predominantly of fibrils. They're composed of accumulation of lipid, damaged membranes, membranous organelles, including mitochondria, autophagosome, and lysosomes, and the different types of synuclein aggregates in the brain. So it's much more complex than we thought. These aggregates are also tend to be heavily post-translationally modified. So this is an image, a stem, a stem microscopy image of a Lewy body. And what you could see is that it contained different forms of synuclein. The center contains mainly truncated form of the protein and the periphery has phosphorylated and unmodified form of the protein. Phosphorylation, 95% of the protein is phosphorylated and the protein is heavily ubiquitinated. These PTNs have been used as markers of pathology. You know, that's how we actually monitor the pathology using antibodies against phosphorylated protein. But what do they do and what is their role in pathology formation was not clear. More recently with advances of cryo-electron microscopy, we discovered that the gap between what we study in the lab and what happens in the brain becomes more clearer. So if you take synuclein, recombinant synuclein in the test tube, you induce it to fibrilize, it can form amyloid fibrils of very different structure. You can see they have different folds. If you isolate alpha-synuclein fibrils from a brain of a patient, you get a fold that is completely different than any of the folds that we have studied in vitro. So what you isolate from the brain has post-translation modification and a structure that is very different from what we've been studying and it is usually used for drug development and to screen for compounds and to develop antibodies. Therefore, it's not surprising if we're developing drugs and antibodies against structure that is different from the brain structure that we think end up failing sort of in the, in the clinic. So in short, what we have is this growing gap between what we can do in the lab and what really happens in the brain. And the question we've been asking is, can we actually bridge this gap and can we reconstruct the complexity? And I will use sort of an example of our lab of how we tried to do this. So the first thing we tried to do is to see, can we reconstruct the complexity at the level of the protein and the level of, of the aggregates? And as I said, this protein is heavily post-translation modified. We did not know what enzymes are involved in regulating these modifications. So what we decided uh, 10 years ago in the lab is to do, is to use mass spec and, and antibodies to profile the, the pathology and define the list of post-translation modification. And then we developed chemical synthesis approaches to synthesize the proteins from scratch, one amino acid at a time. That allows us to produce these proteins with the right modification. And then we studied how these modifications affect aggregation or toxicity in different models. And more recently, we've looked at the role of post translation modification in regulating pathology spreading in the brain. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this is basically how we do it. We take a big protein like synuclein, we split it into a number of fragments, in this case, three. Each of these fragments is produced synthetically using solid phase peptide synthesis. 
And then basically in the lab, we have a, use a chemistry called native chemical ligation to stretch this protein back. This gives us the flexibility to add any PTM on the protein or multiple PTMs and, and then to generate the protein of desired interest. So we think of it like plain level. This is basically how it works. These are the three fragments. You can see that the fragments usually, one has an N-terminal cysteine and the other one has a thioester. And then in this case, the other cysteine is protected. We put this at pH seven, we add the second fragment and then at pH 7.5, the reaction goes readily. We lower the pH to open up the protecting group. We add the third fragment and then voila, we make the protein. If the protein doesn't have cysteines, we desulfurize back to alanines and we have all native sequences of this protein. And this allows us basically to then generate all the post-translation modified forms of the protein. It's always painful for me to show this in a single slide because a typical synthesis for a big protein like this takes about three to four years to optimize. But we've managed to do this for synuclein, for full length tau, which is 440 amino acids, and we can now produce the site-specifically modified forms of the protein, as well as the Huntington protein. And what we've learned from this effort from the Huntington work is that this PTM code is a combinatorial code. It involves crosstalks between the different PTMs. And our approach to PTMs have been basically based on investigating one PTM at a time. So with this, what we did is we generated 46 form of alpha synuclein, which is the entire proteoform that's been detected in blood CSF or the brain. And then with this, we were able to begin to ask the question, you know, do these modifications we see in the brain enhance aggregation or, or actually prevent it or modify it? And to our surprise, and this was the, the first lesson from deconstructing that complexity, that all the major modification we see in the brain, ubiquitination, phosphorylation at multiple sites, actually tend to prevent the aggregation of the protein or stabilize the protein that, rather than promote its, its aggregation with the exception of this C-terminal transition. So this has taught us that what we thought, I mean, there were a number of companies developing drugs against enzymes that to inhibit the enzymes that induce these modifications. And here we show that these modifications are actually good for the protein, thanks to this sort of reductionist approach. So the idea that these PTMs are not important for initiation of pathology, but they may be important for later step in terms of regulating how these fibrils go on to form uh, inclusions. Another thing, this has led us to, to open up a new opportunity because once we saw that phosphor modification like phosphorylations inhibit aggregation, we then went into animal models and we could show that enhancing phosphorylation with the kinase like BLK2 in, in sort of targets the nuclein for degradation and also inhibits its aggregation, leading to protection against loss of dopaminergic neuron. Similarly, in animal one rat models, if we mimic phosphorylation at CD87 by glutamate, it reduces both aggregation and protects against toxicity. So somewhat the pathology had told us could be pathogenic turned out to be protected. We also learned that PTMs may not modify the course of the aggregation, but it can actually modify the type of structures that are formed at the end. In this case, we see that nitration at this residue or 125 or polyubiquitination of synuclein induces the formation of very different types of aggregates. And we speculated that this could be one factor that contribute to the pathological heterogeneity in the brain that I discussed. And indeed, recent studies from Alzheimer's disease and teopathies using cryoelectron microscopy of material isolated from the brain show that the different types of tau aggregates are characterized by different patterns of post-translation modification. So now we're you know, thinking of these PTMs in a completely different way. But now, you know, how do we go from, from this to reconstructing the whole pathology in neurons? And the work I will be describing is work that was we have published in these recently over the past a year and a half in these three papers. <clears throat> so the idea we thought in the beginning is maybe we go and use an animal model of the ones that are used 
And we conducted an extensive survey of these animal models. And in fact, our results and reflections are summarized in this review article in Nature Neuroscience published last year. And what we found is none of these models reproduces the human pathology. And all of these models were based on overexpression uh, of alpha synuclein. So we wanted to try to see whether the, you know, the overexpression induces an artifact and we wanted to see whether we can look at aggregation of the endogenous protein. And this was uh, sort of uh, inspired by work by Virginia Lee at the University of Pennsylvania, where she showed that if you take recombinant proteins of alpha synuclein or pro of aggregates isolated from the brain or fibrils in vitro, you inject them in mouse brain, then what they do is they actually do two things. They spread to different brain regions, and then they actually recruit the endogenous protein and you get pathology formation that is progressive and increases with time and it spreads to different regions. This is with the endogenous protein. So we were interested to model this complex process. We wanted to do this in cells because cells allows us to use advanced imaging studies and omics to be able to monitor the process in details and to correlate the process with neuronal response and degeneration. So we tried the same thing in, in cells. And what you can see is that if we take these aggregates, we add them to primary cultures from wild type mouse. And we look after 14 days, we can see that these small fibrils have grown into very large fibrils, meaning they've recruited the endogenous protein. You can see them very obviously here in the neurons. And they are phosphor, they have the prominent uh, signature, which is phosphorylation at CD129. In fact, they have all the disease the, the type of uh, post-translational modification that we see in the brain. They're phosphorylated, they're ubiquitinated, and they have the C-terminal modification, and the truncation patterns is very much identical to what's in the brain. So then we, up to now, what I've showed you is that we can begin to approach this complexity. We started with naked fibrils produced in recombinant protein. We can use protein synthesis to produce fibrils that are modified, but we can now isolate fibrils from neurons that have not only the post-translational modification, but also the interactome, for example, P62 bind to these fibrils. But how do we go from fibrils to Lewy bodies? And we struggled this for a long time. We looked for many things this, and then inspired by some in animal mouse experiment we did, it turns out the main difference is that all we have to do is wait. So between seven to 14 days in this model, we see only fibrils. Between 14 to 21 days, we see the remodeling of the fibrils. So fibrils are not static, they're very dynamic structures. And now the formation of what looks like a Lewy body structure. To determine whether this is indeed Lewy body and to what extent is similar to what's in the brain, we used extensive correlative light electron microscopy studies. And we looked at the structure of these aggregates at different time points. And what we see is that at very early time points, day seven, these aggregates are formed mainly in the norites and they're single filaments. At day 14, we can see they move from the norites to the cell body and they are remodeled, they are now clumped together, and this is linked to C-terminal truncation. And we see the beginning of the organization of organelles around these structures. By 21 days, you see now what looks like a Lewy body, and it's a sac containing amyloid, you know, synuclein fibrils, autophagosomes, lysosomes, mitochondria, and others. So it seems that in this neuronal model, we're able to reproduce that complexity. So in this model, we show the same topography. That is, you know, the, the pathology start in the norites, move to the cell bodies, and then you get Lewy bodies. When we compare the proteome of Lewy bodies isolated from the brain to the proteome of the Lewy bodies we generate in this model, we have about 65 to 83% similarity and about 90% similarity, for example, when we compare just cytoskeletal proteins. And what we see within these inclusions is, is basically a lot of proteins that belong to the quality control machinery, autophagy, chaperones, ubiquitin proteasome systems, suggesting that this process may be linked to disruption of protein homeostasis and the quality control machinery. At the level even of the organization of the different synuclein proteins, we see the same level of organization that is truncated species in the middle, 
phosphorylated species in the periphery. And these are then surrounded by neurofilament and mitochondria. Uh, so we've been able to reproduce these things at the level of the ultrastructural proteome and organization of synuclea. So is it possible to reproduce that complexity? And I'd like to say yes. Uh, again, you know, these are not, these are Lewy bodies formed over 21 days, whereas what we have in the brain usually takes about a long time. So what I, so I showed you before that the brain is, the, the, the pathology is heterogeneity, is heterogeneous. So can we actually reproduce this heterogeneity in this model? And what we found is that indeed, if we simply change the nature of the fibrils, sorry, I lost my arrow here. If we use fibrils of different sequences, in this case, this mutation, which we just was just discovered, the AD3Q, then you can produce a diverse set of pathology, including the classical brainstem pathology. So using this, you know, the, the, what I wanted to show is that, again, we can begin to bridge that complexity. And, and the goal is to take this now into iPS C uh, cells and organoids, this is ongoing. But most importantly than just reproducing the pathology is that this allows us to actually use this model to reconstruct all the events that go leads from the initial seeding event where we have fibrils go into the cell, they get cleaved at the C terminus, recruit the endogenous protein, they get phosphorylated first, then ubiquitinated, ubiquitin attracts P62, and then these newly formed fibrils, in order to pack them together, they have to go C-terminal truncation because the C-terminal has 12 negative charge and it would be difficult to pack the fibrils. What we're still trying to figure out is at what point do these organelles come into the play and how do they interact to form the Lewy body, okay? So with this model now, what we also now, because we can now uncouple the two steps, we can uncouple the aggregation from Lewy, the fibrillization from Lewy body formation. So we wanted to see, to ask the question, does aggregation drive neurodegeneration? And if it is, is fibrillization is the main driver or the formation of these Lewy bodies? And we suspected this because of the accumulation of organelles. We thought that this process could lead to accumulation of dysfunctional organelles. And this was extensive study by transcriptomics, imaging, and proteomics. And, and just to show you a couple data, what we showed is basically at day seven, we have a lot of fibrils in the neurites and some cell bodies, but no signs of mitochondrial dysfunction, autophagy deficit, or synaptic dysfunction. At day 14, when we only have fibrils, we began to see synaptic dysfunction slight mitochondria, but disruption of the autophagy system already there. At 21 days, where we have the Lewy bodies is where we see the major neuronal dysfunction events, meaning you know, major changes in mitochondria respiration and also disruption of uh, autophagy. If we look at neurodegeneration here by looking at either uh, membrane disruption LDH release or by counting the neurons, we can see that we began to see neurodegeneration at day 14, but the major cell loss occurred during the transition from fibrils to Lewy bodies. And you can see that here, we don't see any change in glial cells. So what we, the idea here is basically that the, the presence of fibrils, it is enough to induce sort of neuronal dysfunction, but cell that seem to be linked to the second step that involves recruitment of organelles. And that, you know, if this is true, then basically, you know, neurons that form Lewy bodies should be ones that are destined to die. And this actually, we wanted to do this experiment, but somebody else did it. They have a, a model that expresses synuclein with GFP, so they can see synuclein. They add fibrils, just like we did in the neurons, and they can see the induction of pathology, which become compact over time. And then they monitor the fate of neurons that show this pathology. And what they showed is that most neurons that show this pathology are actually the neurons that die. So this turns out to be not a characteristics of Parkinson model. We did the same thing for Huntington. And we can show that Huntington inclusions are also not made of just fibrils. They have lipids and they have very specific architecture where you have the core is made mainly by polyglutide by the Huntington 
surrounded by accumulation of organelles that seems to come as the fibril grow during the second phase. What is interesting is while Lewy bodies take 21 days to form, in the case of Huntington inclusions, as you can see in this time to lapse, it takes about half an hour to form. Okay. And there, what we show is that in the case of Huntington, we have an initial process that is driven by the polyglutamine repeat in Huntington, most likely through phase separation. And then the recruitment of organelle is mediated by the growth of the fibrils and interaction with the non-aggregating domain. So as what you can see is that these processes that we see of pathology formation are not simple ones that can be investigated just at the level of uh, uh, protein. And that these secondary event, including the interaction of these aggregates and the cell appear to be a major driver of this neurodegeneration. In the Huntington, what we saw when we looked at nuclear versus cytoplasmic, the nuclear aggregates are made mainly of fibrils. So the site of aggregation also dictates the nature of aggregate. In the nucleus, it's purely fibrils. In the cytoplasm, it's more complex, which means trying to target these with the same approach or they may not work. So I'd like to end here with revisiting the first question, which is, is aggregation a cause or a consequence? And what my point here is that if we try to look at ag ag if disease in relation to aggregates, it's not possible to answer that question. If we start to look in terms of the process of aggregation, as we saw in this model, then we can have some explanation. But first, I would like to remind people, because people think of aggregates as sort of once they form, they're inert. And what I've shown you is that they have a complex interactome with proteins, lipid, and cellular organelles. They interact with several enzymes and subjected to PTNs that regulate their structure and dynamic. And they undergo biochemical and structural remodeling as the transition from one state to another during pathology formation. And what we have also shown over the years is that the seeding process and fibril growth is a key player, not only in the propagation of the aggregate and spreading, but also in the proteotoxicity. So the dynamics of the fibroid is also possible. So now how do we explain that you have pathology in brain of people who are healthy? If you can think of this process, as I told you, and you have aggregation takes place, and you have these aggregates and dysfunctional organelles, then we can think of Lewy body, for example, as a protective process because if it can sequester all of these material efficiently into this Lewy body structure, then it could serve as a detoxification mechanism. Then it would be, if you see it in a healthy individual, it means that the neuron did the job right. So if it, this process stalls for any reason, for example, defect in the machinery or the processes required for Lewy body formation or the enzymes involved for PTMs, then you would have an accumulation of protein aggregates and dysfunctional organelles, but you will not have Lewy bodies. And therefore you will have neurodegeneration, cell death, but no Lewy bodies to count. So counting you know, the Lewy bodies or amyloid plaques may not be the best way to, look at, to, to study this relationship. The other possibility is that these protein aggregates could be the early fibrillization they trigger a pathogenic cascade that is independent of the maturation into Lewy bodies. And this could again explain why we have Lewy bodies and lack of correlation between Lewy body burden and neurodegeneration and suggest that cell death occurs much later. So we can think of Lewy bodies potentially as protective provided that they could be cleared. Now the cases of genetic Parkinson where there are no pathology also mean that there are possibly some subtypes of Parkinson's disease that are caused by mechanisms completely independent of aggregation. So we have to keep that uh, option open. So what we're trying to do now is to begin to integrate these models, to begin to study pathology, co-pathologies in the same model. And we've now, and for example, in this case, we can produce nuclear Huntington aggregates and cytoplasmic synuclein in neurons. And we're also moving to iPSCs because this allows us to look over months so we can look at maturation and clearance of this pathology in iPCs or midbrain cultures. And preliminary studies by other groups show that it's possible to induce pathology in both of these models. 
And with that, I would like to end by hopefully saying that neurodegenerative diseases are complex, but the only way to tackle these diseases is to embrace, this con deconstruct and reconstruct their complexity. The better we get at modeling this complexity and more controllable system becomes, the better our understanding of the mechanisms. And shrinking this gap between what happens in the brain and what we can study in the lab is crucial to facilitate and accelerate translational research. And what I hope I was able to show you is that through these cellular models, cryo-EM, FLAM, and uh, sort of protein synthetic strategy, we can begin to tackle these complexities. We still need new tools for imaging. Uh, the, the PTM code is, is a computatorial code, so that we will never be able to crack it using experiments. We need computational approaches to study effective PTMs and crosstalk between PTMs. Today, they are non-existent. And for the most part, we will need access to human tissues if we are to, to, to study that complexity. And I'd like to think by acknowledging the people who were key to this, Anne Lohr is a senior scientist in the lab who led the development of the model with the collaboration of this talented group of students and postdocs, and also with the help of the bioimaging and bioinformatic and gene expression facility at the EPFL, and all members of the team, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Wow. Questions? Dave Hatter first, then. Hi, um, you pointed out uh, how that um, in the neurofibrillar tangles of A beta, tau is all associated uh, all the time. But, but 15 years ago or so, um, people are arguing, uh, uh, proposing, in fact, following Dennis Selko, that is oligomers that are neurotoxic and, and, and not, 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 not the final uh, 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 aggregated state. I wanna know where that stands. And, as a, as a, and, and, and what is the status of oligomers in the Parkinson's? Because you pointed out when the aggregates form, you start losing motor functions. And so is there any role for oligomers in, in Parkinson's? And, and I think I'll stop. So, yeah. so I can talk about Parkinson's first because we have worked on this and we have data. As I said, you know, one of the major problems we have in the field is in the tools we use. So oligomers do likely exist in the brain, but the evidence for oligomers in the brain, I would say is not in terms of in the native brain is, 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 or whether they are the cause of toxicity is not strong. One reason for this is the tools that people have been using are the wrong tools. In fact, the Michael J. Fox commissioned us two years ago to, re, to revalidate 17 antibodies that people have used to test and prove the, uh, the oligomer hypothesis. These were antibodies that people developed and were supposed to recognize only oligomers. They assembled these antibodies for us from labs, from companies. We did an extensive panel of characterization. Our work was independently validated by a company and the conclusion which is accepted by all the community now not a single antibody was oligomer specific. All the antibodies that recognize oligomers recognize fibrils and they did not have any structural specificity. So that raised into question a lot of the data about oligomers in the brain. Now we have now a paper that we're getting ready to release where we can show that the concept that oligomers are not more toxic than fibrils, actually fibrils are, Oligomers are not responsible for the propagation of pathology. If we take oligomers inject in the brain, they don't see pathology, they don't propagate, they don't see propagation of pathology in vitro, in the neurons, in the brain. And since we don't know what type of oligomers in the brain, we actually use the library of different oligomers to prove this. So I think the oligomer hypothesis was a simple way of explaining the lack of correlation between amyloid and tau burden and, and, and disease progression. And what I tried to highlight is that the lack of correlation is, too to, is related to many other factors 
than just oligomer formation. Uh, you know, it was just a simple explanation when people said aggregation is not important because fibros do not correlate to the disease. People said that oligomers are the main species. All antibody-based therapies targeting oligomers have failed. Okay. So I think we need, you know, that hypothesis need to be revisited carefully. The oligomers may have a role in the process, but it's not what has been described in, in, as of the, until today. Thanks, Lil. Um, you said that when the Lewy bodies are forming or maturing, the alpha synuclein is C-terminally truncated. Mm -hmm. Is that happening because of a change in RNA splicing pattern or proteolysis? That's actually proteolysis. And what we showed is, is, is that that cleavage is necessary to promote, um, I can show you nicely here. I can do this. Okay. So basically when these fibrils form, they have the C terminal is, is there and it has a lot of negative charge. And therefore, if the cell tries to pack them into Lewy bodies, it's difficult because of the high charge density. You know, so there are there are two possible ways to to over, to deal with this. One is either you have uh, C terminal truncation. This is the hypothesis, and you promote lateral association of the protein and packing into Lewy bodies, which we actually see a decrease in C terminal protein interacting proteins, or you can bind other proteins to neutralize the charge. So we tested this hypothesis. We used our protein synthesis strategy. And what we did is we generated a form of synuclein that can be site-specifically cleaved with light because we couldn't compare truncated and full length. They, form, they start in different. So when we make these fibrils from the full length and now we shine light to cleave the C-terminus, you can see that they start to pack. And if you express, so we think these C-terminal, they're actually enzymatic cleavages uh, and 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 uh, and they're mediated by calpane is one of the enzymes. Now that being said, we published a paper two weeks ago. It's in preprint, where we can show that the astrocytic pathology of synuclein, the synuclein accumulates in astrocyte, is actually completely cleaved at residue thirty and one o three, and there is not a single molecule of folate. And there, we think it could be a different splicing form in, in the astrocytes. In the astrocytes. In the astrocytes. The paper is, is in bioarchive, if you look at. I had another quick question. So when you treat the neurons in a cell culture dish with the fibrils, how do the fibrils get into the cells? This is mainly through endocytosis. They go through the endocytic pathway and they're actually cleaved while going through the endocytic pathway and then they escape. Here we have one more question, Peter. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you got more time than two weeks ago where you had 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, it was very interesting to hear more. Um, it, it, it seems to me that one of the attractive features about aggregates has always been this propagation phenomenon. And uh, I wondered what was known a, quantitatively about it, like what is the speed of transport of pathology, and then also whether there aren't surgical in, in interventions, at least not in the brain perhaps, but if something starts in your gut and has to make its way up to your brain, I could imagine that some surgical intervention might uh, at least prevent you from getting the brain disease. Has anyone yeah, so, looked at that? Yeah, I, I will qualify this first to say that the evidence for pathology spreading in, in the brain from human is still not conclusive, okay? From the animal models, it's very strong. You inject and you can, it spreads in a very predictable manner. You know, you can, it, it spreads through interconnected, uh, anatomically connected regions, and, but also there are other mechanisms. So there, you know, a lot of these studies were inspired by, you know, the transplant where people, in, you know, grafted neurons into the brain of patients and then the dopaminergic neurons and they came after 14 years and they found Lewy bodies in these grafted neurons. So the idea was that the aggregate from a healthy, from a, uh, the sick brain was transported into this and that's what sort of spun out this whole field. Uh, so in terms of the, the, the surgical intervention, 
in, in, in preclinical model, yes, you can inject PFF induced pathology in the gut. If you cut the vagus nerve, it actually, no pathology goes to the brain. In human, there were large epidemiological studies in Scandinavia where they looked at 10,000 patients who had bigotomy, where they, this used to be a surgical procedure to treat for also. And they retrospectively look at these and they found the people who actually underwent this procedure were protected by 35%. Now there are some studies that came afterward and, and, and so no relation, so this is still not yet sorted out. Uh, but what is, what is clear is that we can detect pathology in the skin, we can detect pathology in the colon, we can detect pathology in many places. And actually you can use skin biopsies now to diagnose Parkinson disease, but mostly advanced cases. Uh, so this relationship between you know, pathology in, in, in the body and the brain, you know, the fact is we can see the same pathology in both places. The question is whether this exchange or transport as a main mechanism for uh, regulating the progression of the clinical symptoms of the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank you all again. Thank you very much. And again, I apologize for not being there. <laughs>